Hey, I'm Marshall, and welcome back to Gaming for Tokens. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the various components that you can attach to game objects, kind of like what I did in the last episode with the cube, uh, and talking a little bit about scene organization and the different primitives and things you can create in Unity. Basically, the objects that will make up 90% of your prototypes and objects in game. Um, but first, the first thing we the first thing we need to do is to set up the scene in a usable way. People have different definitions of what usable is. Mine is um, standard for every project that I do. I want to fill out this this project window with the various folders and and places for things to live, so that I don't go crazy with unorganization. Uh, the easiest place to find where this project folder lives is by right-clicking and hitting on Show Explorer, which opened up on my other monitor. Let me drag it over here. Um, this is what you should see when you do that. Uh, this is the file structure of a Unity project. This is an empty, empty Unity project, so there's not going to be nothing in here. But the Assets folder is specifically this project folder. So if we create a new folder here and name it Stuff, and we go back into Unity, our stuff folder shows up here. Likewise, if we go back into the assets folder and we go into stuff and then create a new folder in here called new folder, and we go back to Unity, it will have a new folder. Um, this is effectively just an explorer view that you're seeing. So Anything that you put into here, so any files like text documents or, or anything really, I guess even program shortcuts and stuff, if that's, I don't know, I don't know why you do that, but it'll show up in your project finder here. So usually what I do is I have a, um, uh, let me delete these empty folders, and in my assets folder, I uh, usually copy and paste these. These, this is a, uh, a Unity project that I created. Well, I guess it's not, it's not a Unity project, it's just a, um, uh, a file structure that I have on my computer somewhere. And this is the naming conventions and things that I use standard across all of my projects. The reason why I do it this way is the underscore will always bump it to the top of the list because in the project window, which if I click in here, it'll update. If uh, the, the underscore puts the, that folder at the top of the list, so in other words, if I create a, a new C sharp thing, it'll end up at the bottom with the exclusion of player data. And I, in later, 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 later videos, I will get to what I use player data for, um, like saving save files and, and like output data and stuff like that. That'll go into a player data. But the rest of this stuff is like, this is where I keep all my textures that I import and my fonts that I create and import and my prefabs that I make. And this is a place for them to live. So now that I have this, I can start working on the project. It's kind of a weird intermediate step that's really, really optional, but I definitely need this for my project to go smoothly. If I can't find the asset that I'm looking for, that's a problem, and that should be a problem for you. Um, so organization is a big part of this, especially if you're working on a team or you ever think about, like one of the things that I'm really not good at in, in the project pipeline is once I get down to the point where I need sound, I kind of flounder. I, I can't, I'm not a very good sound editor. <laughs> so I usually bring somebody else in for sound and for music and sound effects and that kind of thing. The, um, at that point, if I wanted to give them my unity project and it was a mangled mess of, of assets with random names and random places, that's just asking for them to fail. That's not helping them at all. You want something organized. You want them to be able to find their sounds folder. What they do with it from there is completely up to them. Hopefully they have the same amount of like work respect that you do. That way, you know, everything goes smoothly. But in all reality, this is going to help you work with others and work with yourself. So that being said, now we can go on to creating things in our scene view. Um, the first thing we're gonna wanna do the uh, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the different components or the different, sorry, the different primitives. So there's the cubes and there's the spheres and the capsules and the 
cylinders and I'm gonna save those last two for for uh, for a minute so the these are your three basic primitives that you get in a lot of your 3d programs the cube being the most basic of them um, all of these objects every single one of them uh, oh so here's an interesting thing if you select multiple objects that have uh, the same components so like this has a box collider this has a capsule collider if I select this and the capsule they show the components for both and I can edit both of them so I can change like the radius on this on both of them but if I select like a cube and a cylinder the the collider goes away because they don't share that aspect so I can't edit that on both of them because they both don't have that if that makes sense so anyway these are your basic components this is or your basic sorry your basic primitives you have a cube a cylinder a sphere and a capsule the capsule and the, the cylinder both use a capsule collider. There is no such thing as a, a cylinder collider in Unity unless you use a mesh collider, which we'll get to that. Um, which, well, actually, I can show you that um, right now, I guess. Mm, yeah, sure. So this has a capsule collider just like that does, like I said. If we wanted to make this more accurate, because right now it's effectively cutting off the corners, it's rounding it in like that, um, which I can demonstrate by raising the height. See how it's like cutting off that corner? If we wanted to make this a lot more accurate, what we could do is we could remove this component, like that, and go to Component, Physics, Mesh Collider. Mesh Collider, uh, it uses whatever vertices the mesh has as the bounding box for it, instead of like this thing here, which you can see the, uh, the collider by the green box when you select the thing. So this is, the cube collider. It's using basically a mesh collider, but it's a cube collider. It's not because just because the mesh is a cube doesn't necessarily mean that the um, the object has to use a cube collider. For example, if we change the mesh here to a sphere, a sphere can have a cube collider because why not? It's just they're different components. So they don't have anything to do with each other. But as soon as we make this a cube, it looks like a mesh component and it or mesh collider component. It's kind of using the mesh collider component in a weird way. And um, this is the collider that it's using for the cylinder. This is obviously very inefficient because it's using a lot of vertices that um, aren't necessarily helping. The only vertices that are actually um, hmm, the only vertices that are actually doing anything are the outside ones. The inside two on the top, the caps, aren't doing anything for you. A lot of the uh, the vertices on the outside edge aren't doing anything for you really they're forming a frame but at that rate you may as well be using a a capsule collider which is here because the capsule collider gives you that frame and it gives you the length for the most part without the corners so it's I don't know it's kind of up to the user I guess but that's why the uh, cylinders use a capsule collider. Is they're just a lot more efficient. Um, the most efficient of which of the colliders is a sphere collider. Um, the reason why is because it's basically just a point in space and a radius. So um, if something was within is if something was was within a distance to that cube, that distance being the radius here, then it knows it should be colliding with something. The cylinder collider is the second most efficient because it's essentially two uh, two spheres connected by a bridge. The next most efficient being the cube collider because it uses the most vertices. So it's technically the, the least most efficient of all of the objects here. Um, the last two primitives that we had in the list were plane, which creates this, and quad which creates this. So you may be asking yourself or saying to yourself that these are the same thing. These are exactly the same thing. This is a plane and that's a plane. Yes, except this is a very, very high poly plane for some reason. I've never, this is the one question I've always had about Unity is why it created planes this high poly. By high poly, I mean with this many vertices. You can see all the different like uh, here. In wireframe, you can definitely see how how many polygons and how many vertices this thing has. Why is it's always been this burning question that I've had about Unity. 
the only answer that I've ever gotten is that it uses these you can do a lot with these in code like manipulating vertices and doing vertice colors and uh, all sorts of advanced stuff but for your everyday use this is really pointless and furthermore why something this high poly comes with a mesh collider is beyond me this is the this is the collider for this object it's super inefficient it's not what you want to use at all if you wanted a more efficient version of this you can just add a box collider and remove the mesh collider and make sure that the the Y size is something other than whatever it starts as something other than zero and you have essentially the exact same thing but with a fraction of the the uh, cost in, in processing power that is a much better route but then they released this thing which is the uh, the quad in recent version in this version of unity I think actually and um, it's essentially just a low poly plane with a mesh collider. So it uses one, two, three, four vertices. And um, this was using an absurd amount, I think 100. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's 10 quads, uh, 10, 10 squared quads in this bank, in this plane. Which means, I uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of verts there that you just don't need when you can use this, or you can use a box collider. So I never really understood that, but that's your different primitives and kind of a an explanation of different colliders. Um, yeah, so let's see what else we have in this menu here. Oh, I deleted my camera. Don't want to delete that. Boop. Um, we have particle systems, cameras. So the camera is is this thing, and um, yep, just you can create as many of these as you want. It's a camera. It comes with a couple different um, a couple different stats, but that's something for a later video. Uh, so are particle systems. We'll get to those later, and and text and all that stuff. But a three D text is kind of neat. It just creates a text object that reads text. Um, I can explain that later but that creates text and you can change it over here to say whatever you want to say. Um, lights, there are four different kinds of light. There's a directional light and um, I'm gonna throw a cube and a plane in the scene. Plane. As kind of a display case for you to see what these different lights do. So there is the plane. And here is the cube. Do, do, do. Scale that thing up, rotate it a little, and we have a cube on a plane. So the directional light here is kind of, uh, it can be kind of strange to wrap your head around at first, but basically think about it like a sun. It uh, is light coming from the direction that those lines are pointing in, or so the local because I have it in local, the local Z direction. So if we rotate this, it'll change the direction the light's coming from. Um, in Unity Pro, you have the ability to add shadows. In Unity Free, uh, you don't, last I checked. Um, and the shadows are over here. If you're doing this, if you do hard shadows, then you get a shadow, um, which can be easier to see what it's doing now. Um, you'll notice that the position of the object doesn't actually matter at all. It's um, unlike every other light. It is a wall of light coming from a direct. It's this is essentially just a direction. It doesn't care about position. It doesn't care about distance. It doesn't care about any of that. It, it cares only about direction, and that's what a directional light is. Um, there's some other stats over here like intensity, and these are going to be standard across most of the lights in Unity. Um, the intensity, the color, so we can change it to be a red light if we want. Um, Cookie is, uh, is if, if you're, I have a theater background, so if you're, if you have that background as well, then you know this is probably a gobo. Um, it's, think about like you're holding up a flashlight and you put a piece of paper in front of that flashlight and the piece of paper has uh, a design cut out. So it's something that blocks light from going through in a pattern and you just feed it a texture like it, like it shows. Um, I'll have an example of that later. Uh, and then the cookie size is uh, how big do you want it to go over the, like, if you set it to one, then it's going to be a one for one 
um, uh, representation of the texture. Uh, anyway, the the next thing is a shadow type. So there's hard and soft shadows. If you switch to soft shadows, um, I can kind of show you what that does here. So this is a soft shadow, and this is a hard shadow. The hard shadow doesn't. Um, this particular one is using the quality settings. If we change this to very high resolution, we get very crisp lines, really inefficient. But you see that it's hard lines. If we use soft shadows, then it's blurred lines, and we can change how much it is blurred, how far away from objects it, it goes. Um, change the, the softness and the softness fade, which um, hopefully I can tinker this just a little bit so you can see how that works do, do, do. softness fade from what I remember about softness fade it's the distance from the start of the shadow to the so like this point in the shadow is that point in the object if we look up at our light you can see that that makes sense um, so the distance from this point to that point means that this part of the shadow will be more blurred is I believe what softness fade does and again if you um, Ooh. If you hover over most of the things, they give you little tool tips, um, but not that one. This one does sort of, and that one, very unhelpful. It just says resolution. Whatever. You get the idea. Um, drawing halo is something that I don't think I've ever actually seen on a directional light before. Maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't. I don't think it works for directional lights because, dire uh, again, directional lights only have a direction, and halo is when you look at the light, does it have like an orb around it? Um, which we will see in the next type of light. Uh, flares are kind of sort of the same thing. They're um, lens flares. You can create them over here in your project view. You can uh, lens flare right there, and you feed it textures, and then it'll, uh, when you look at the light source, which I believe directional lights, that's the only time that the position of it matters is when you use a lens flare, because if you actually look at the directional light object, you'll see that the lens flare happen. It's very, very J.J. Abrams, and, and yeah, people like to do it. <laughs> um, the render mode, uh, this seems kind of funny because it's important, not important. Um, think about it like the a queue. Does it, what's the priority that Unity uses to render the light in? That's kind of, that's kind of what that is. And the, the culling mask is uh, the layers, so... This cube is on default. If we put this cube in ignore raycast, for example, and we tell the directional light to ignore ignore raycast, it won't light the cube. So that's a way to define uh, light, to restrict lights to only lighting certain things, if that makes sense. If we say nothing, then it won't light anything. Uh, if we say just default, it'll just light this, because it's that's in default. Um, by default, all the lights have everything on they, all the lights light all the things and by default everything is also in the default layer which makes sense um, light mapping is something that we will cover in a later video but it's basically the final stages of a large project that has lots of lights and is very very pretty you usually want to light map that to make the game run <laughs> at all because typically speaking you're gonna have um, a lot of baked lights uh, what that means is the lights aren't actually working they're just um, kind of uh, so like a lot of the old N64 games and things like that had painted on lights. Artists went in and they painted lights, uh, like they painted the light in. Um, they just made part of textures darker and part of textures lighter, and that was the lighting in the scene. Uh, the way that the games are were made nowadays is you put lights in the scene, like this directional light, and then you bake them into textures instead. So everything is, is uh, physically simulated instead of um, artistically represented. Uh, and light mapping is the way to do that. So if we say baked only, then that means that it will um, it'll only ever work in a baked lighting situation. In, and real time means that it'll only ever work in a real time situation. And auto means that it will only work, um, it, it'll decide if it has a baked um, 
if it has a if we baked lights with that light then it will only do baked and if we haven't then it'll only do real time kind of thing it's i don't know light mapping is strange and we'll get there later but it's important to know that that's a setting on here and that that's a thing that we can mess with the other types of light that we have are point light and this is um this one is basically the exact opposite of the directional light in a strange way because this one has positional coordinates and that's what all of the light is based off of is the positional coordinates so if we look down on our scene down on the bottom uh, our game view we can see that uh, as i move the light around things that are closer to the light are more illuminated and things that are farther away are less illuminated this is like so the directional light was like a sun this is like a lamp bulb or like um a torch or something like that uh, and this has a couple different stats on it so it has a range which is the effective range of the light and it has a color just like before so we can change this to like a, a nice warm yellowy thing or orangey light and it has an intensity um, so we can bring that down if we want it has a cookie just like the directional light and it has shadow types just like the directional light now it's interesting that I put this on hard shadows uh, and it comes up with a warning message. It says only directional lights have shadows and forward rendering. The forward rendering, the rendering type that your scene uses is found in your build in your player settings. Remember the thing that I talked about that said I said it was really deceptive and it probably shouldn't be um, labeled player settings. It should be labeled game settings. It's in there. So in the player settings, we have um, under other settings, we have the rendering path forward, deferred, vertex. Vertex lit means that um, you're lighting individual vertices, so the the quality of your lighting is based on the amount of vertices in the, the objects that you're lighting. Forward, um, I'm not exactly sure what the technical difference is between forward and deferred, but I do know that deferred lets you have shadows on your lights. So it's usually what I use. <laughs> um, I wish I had a better answer, but I don't. But now that I check that to deferred, I have shadows on my point light. And um, I can use hard shadows and soft shadows with this. I usually, for point lights, being point lights are usually going to be baked. Well, that's not true. Directional lights are usually uh, runtime and not runtime. because So baked and not baked. Because the sun, it, it depends on the character that you're using. And if there are characters in your game that move. Um, a game like a game that has characters running around, you're going to want the characters to have shadows. Um, being the characters move, the characters are not baked because they have um, different lighting as they move around the environment. It's that means that you won't be baking that light. With um, things that don't move, like say you have a, a boulder in a field, that's never going to move, and neither is the field. So the shadows that the field and the boulder cast can probably be baked. Um, so if I this was my scene and I knew this cube was never going to move and I knew this plane was never going to move and I knew this light was never going to move, I could bake the lighting in the scene and be fine. If that's the case, then I probably want to use the best lighting settings that I can for these lights, being they're going to be baked. Um, what that means is that the game isn't going to be running or rendering the lights during the game, like while the game is running. So um, I might as well make it as good as I can make it because it's going to cost the same as making it as crappy as I can make it. Uh, this light also comes with a the draw halo button. The draw halo, that should be drawing a halo and it's not... Oh, is it based off the intensity? I think it is. No. Weird. Well, usually that creates a little ball of light where the uh, the uh, uh, light is. It creates a little orb of light. But it's not, and I don't know why. That's fine. Um, again, this has all the same light mapping and culling mask and render mode things. So if we put our cube back to ignore raycast and put the point light to ignoring ignore raycast then it doesn't light the cube um, same old stuff the other lights that we have are a spotlight which is exactly how it sounds it is a light 
that we can rotate and angle and um, has a range just like these um, the the point light had and it has a spot angle so we can um, change the the amount of stuff that is encompassed within the the spotlight the cool thing about this light is that it's brighter where it's up front and the um, the fall off of the spot is harsher than when it's out farther so as the distance goes on and we can see this by pulling this back we'll see that this uh, this line right here will become more faded as we pull back if we can keep it on the, there we go um, these are usually what uh, people use in scenes to make things look nice. A combination of spotlights and point lights, usually with like a directional light or two, but these are the primary lights are the uh, spotlight and point light. Again, this has soft and hard shadows. If we go soft shadows, then we get um, our typical... Uh, ooh. Our, our, well, soft shadows, I guess, doesn't get any stats on this at all, but that's fine. It gets a bias, which the bias is the um, the distance away from the the object, I guess. So it like pushes the shadow back. If you look here, you'll see that the shadow starts to kind of move away from the object. It can be used for like fine tuning where your shadows are, but that's uh, usually you, you don't touch it. And you'll notice that there's uh, visual manipulators here on the spotlights to make the spot angle bigger or. Uh, go farther um, really handy uh, I use them all the time and all your other typical stuff like draw halo which still isn't working for some reason and um, the render modes and all that stuff so that's all great and then the last one we have is an area light area lights are interesting um, and you'll there think about them like a plane of light uh, like you, you go into a lot of like hospitals and, and office buildings and stuff like that and they have those overhead fluorescents that are a um, they're a bank of lights but they're diffused by a white piece of plastic in front of them or something like that like a shade this is that white piece of plastic it's a soft light that emits from an area instead of from a specific point of origin the interesting thing about these is you'll notice that it's not casting any light anywhere. Well, yeah, it's it's baked only, and it says that over here in the type. Area lights are baked only. Um, they have a width and a height, so you can define the size, or you can visually drag it. So if you if you want to be precise with your numbers, which I suggest you do, you can say this is 2.5, and this is 3, and now this is a 2.5 by 3 area light. With an intensity of 1 and a color of whatever you want it to be. Uh, I haven't used these yet because I don't usually do a lot of baked lighting in my projects. They're usually not um, fancy enough to, to need it. Um, usually I only use like a light or two in the small projects that I've done in the past. But um, area lights are undoubtedly useful. I've used them a lot in Maya. If they're anything like that, then they're fantastic and pretty and great. Um, you did maybe notice when I pulled down the type bar that you can change the types of lights. So now we have a point light, and now we have a directional light, and now we have a spotlight. So you can jump between the different types of light to, to get exactly what you want, uh, if that's your thing, if that's what you want to do. And that, I believe, is all of the lights. Um, and I've already kind of gone over the primitives. Uh, a sprite is used for... 2D games, as uh, anyone familiar with any retro games would know. You drag and drop a texture in that you define as a sprite, which if you're using the 2D mode, then it'll automatically define your textures as sprites. And uh, you just put that in there and then it creates a mesh based off of the sprite. Um, I will in the future make a video about the 2D stuff once I have a, a better grasp of it. But for now, it's all very new, and I know about, I would say, like 75-80% of it, but there's still that, like, the last stretch of it that kind of eludes me. But um, I will make a video on 2D stuff eventually. It's very, very good and, and, and great so far. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's how you make a sprite. 
and uh, Cloth Sim is a pretty advanced thing and can really damage your performance if you don't know what you're doing with it. Uh, I will make a, um, a cloth video eventually, but for now, that's basically cloth. <laughs> um, it uses a very, very strange, um, strange engine to do things with, and uh, well, it uses the rigid body system, which I am going to talk about in this video, but um, this is a very, very low resolution mesh, as you can see. So it's it looks kind of crappy. If we grab the cloth and we make the, I wonder if there is a, there's a mesh Dropbox. So um, that's what uh, it's this thing over here. So I guess if we drop a higher resolution mesh in or we scale this down, then it will look better because it's it's denser. Uh, between the area that it creates, it is denser. If that makes sense. So the, the area that it encompasses is um, less per vertice. So if we have a sphere instead, then it will look better. But the cloth is also, it's complicated, but um, I'll cover that in a video later as well. I know a little bit about it, uh, the cloth sim stuff. Um, I've used it in the past and it's, it's really cool if you know what you're doing, but if you don't know what you're doing, then it's kind of bad. <laughs> uh, audio reverb zones have to do with audio so the most um, applicable example that I have is if you were making a game and the, you went from being in an outside environment to an inside of like a cave then you could set um, you could put this in there in the cave that is and all of your audio objects that are then created or play in this audio reverb zone will reverberate they'll have an echo so uh, you plunk this into your cave and you suddenly have echoes in your cave. Uh, and then all of these are settings and stuff for that. So if you wanted to say, well, this is a cave, and then there's the settings for the cave. And if you wanted to do custom, you totally can. User specified, you can change every little aspect of this thing and how it reverberates. And you can also use the visual manipulators to see how far the echo goes and how narrow the echo is. So in other words, this would encompass your entire cave and this would maybe come out of your cave a little so that if you were in this and a sound was made it would echo out of the cave which is pretty cool or likewise if a sound was made in there then it would echo out of the cave which is really really fascinating and I think they're great but I've never had a good I've never had a, a good reason to use one I guess I've used them before but only in testing and, and playing with it um, the terrain system is something that people Ooh, and ah in Unity, I don't think it's that great. <laughs> Maybe I'm just uh, cynical about it, but um, which is entirely possible, by the way. It is possible for me to be cynical. <laughs> um, if we throw a directional light in and we toss a hard shadows on it, um, we can take this terrain and we can edit it. So we have all these different tools over here for kind of sculpting the terrain. Um, we bring up the brush size a little bit and we can draw on this terrain to make it wavy and effectively what we're doing is we are um, we're sculpting hills and if we want to do valleys we just say what is the hotkey for it there's a hotkey for it I don't remember what it is but um, it's something uh, the terrain editor is, uh, I'll cover it probably in a later video, but there's a lot to it for, for what it is. Um, but effectively you can sculpt terrain and uh, then come in with a brush to add textures to it and things and then paint over it so you can add like grass in places and dirt in places and things like that. Um, you can also plunk down trees and other um, other assets and unity comes with a bunch in a one of those user or one of those um, the packages in here in the assets drop down there's all these different packages so there's the uh, the the terrain assets and standard assets and tree creator and all that stuff that all has to do with the terrain editor um, there's also you can cap off the height you can all sorts of weird stuff with this like weird strange things uh, but anyway that's the terrain that's how you create one is uh, right there 
There's also Ragdoll, which um, I don't have any of the assets for, but it's uh, if you've ever seen a a uh, a thing in a game like if like in a lot of next gen games like Skyrim, for example, or or Dishonored, or ugh, I'm trying to think of any that I've played recently that have Ragdoll in them. Basically, when you kill an enemy, uh, they fall limp and they kind of flop around. Like you can drag them around and they like they interact with the world after they're they're dead kind of that's usually the way that um people think of ragdoll which is that's that's what that is so you can create a new ragdoll object that um that uses colliders and bones and things like that to flop around the world create a new tree um i don't think oh the tree creator is in unity weird so you can create a new tree and um you can randomly um, define it using a seed and, and do all sorts of crazy strange things with it um, like add leaves and add branches and uh, and it's it's kind of strange and it has this great node based editor but I have I, don't, I haven't ever found a use for it um, it's probably a lot more efficient and a lot better to just create a tree in like Maya and import it in then because then you can bake the lighting onto it easier and it actually creates a mesh instead of creating this weird prefab that has tree data and like strange materials and meshes and things that like you can't manipulate like you can every other object in the game it's just it's kind of a strange thing the tree creator but it exists and it, I mean it works for prototyping totally uh, if you need a forest in a pinch, you can create a tree and then put it in the terrain editor and go to town. Um, wind zones have something to do with uh, um, the rigid body system. So, and it also has a lot to do with the uh, trees because you can have the trees in your terrain editor obey wind and wave in the wind, which is kind of cool. But um, I won't be talking about that. I will be talking about the ridge body system in this video. That's the next thing that I want to talk about. Um, but that I think that pretty much covers all everything in here. Uh, well, for the most part, except for like particle systems, which you can create and you can play with, and they have all sorts of crazy options galore. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I'll cover that in a later video. Uh, particle systems are fantastic. I love playing with them. I think they're they make the game look great if you know what you're doing with them but um that is pretty much everything in the the hierarchy create menu i think uh and by the way if you're not like absorbing all of this right now that's fine i'm gonna go over individual things later and if you have any like any requests or you want me to really delve deep into an individual thing then just let me know in twitter the um uh the the link to all that is in the description of the video, and um, I will be more than happy to delve deep into a topic. Right now, I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and talking about everything, so it's kind of overwhelming. I understand that entirely. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I think that that's everything that you can create using this menu. <laughs> okay, so I think now I want to talk about the rigid body system in Unity. Um, if you've ever played anything like uh, like Angry Birds, that's a game based on the rigid body system of, well, whatever rigid body system they used. Because I think Angry Birds is a Flash game, which means that they made their own. But um, Unity comes with one built in. So uh, going back to our old primitives, we have a cube. And I'll go ahead and throw a directional light in with hard shadows so we can see some stuff. And uh, this cube is going to interact with, well, uh, a plane with a box collider, like I showed. So this thing is going to be zero there, five, three, one, yeah, that'll be zero. There we go, and negative 1.5. So this cube is going to interact with this plane somehow. Um, making a physically 
simulated object, which is what a, a rigid body is. It um, simulates the object using the physics system of Unity is pretty easy. We just uh, select the cube. It already has a collider because you need a collider for your, um, your rigid bodies to work correctly. And you go to Component, Physics, Rigid Body. Um, the default settings for this are um, that it uses gravity, it uses mass, and it has zero drag. Um, it has no constraints, and um, basically the, the default settings are it will fall and it will interact with things. For example, if I hit play, it will fall, hit the plane, and roll over like it would if it was like a big old cardboard box. Um, if we rotate it a little this way, it'll do something different because we rotated it. It'll tumble a little and then center off. Um, if you've never seen a 3D program before, that's probably pretty cool. I, I was fascinated when I was like, oh, God, it's that easy. Oh, geez. Um, it gets even better. Uh, to play around with the rigid body system a little bit, I'm going to ask that you import a package. If you're following along, that is. If you're not following along, then well, shame on you, but you should be. Um, but that's not a problem. <laughs> Go ahead and in, uh, assets, import package, and uh, import physic materials. That's the physical materials. It'll come up with a window that looks like this. Just hit import. And uh, give it a second and it will... Um, oh, it already did it. Wow, that was fast. All right. Uh, over here under the uh, the mesh collider, under the material slot, it says physic material. It's tries to say materials, but it gets cut off. Click the little uh, circle next to it and it'll bring up this browser and you can check what kind of object you want it to be. Do you want it to be a bouncy object? Let's go ahead and throw that in there. Now, when we run it, it'll bounce. It'll uh, be a cube made of rubber, and it'll bounce off into oblivion. To make sure that doesn't happen, I'm going to scale this up a little bit. <laughs> and pull the camera back a tad. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So now we have a cube that'll bounce around like crazy. So say we don't want it to bounce around uh, as much. Maybe we select the cube and we increase the mass. Maybe that'll work. That'll make it heavier. So what that uh, what that essentially means is that um, other objects will interact with it to a lesser degree. Because if you know anything about inertia, um, it essentially has more inertia than other objects. So it doesn't actually change the way it bounces at all. It just changes, um, like if another object was to hit it, that was also bouncy but less massive. You get the idea. Now if we increase the drag, that will definitely slow it down. If we increase the angular drag, that will also definitely slow it down. Um, hovering over these will tell you a little bit about them. So like the, um, the mass of the body, da, da, da. Uh, the linear drag coefficient, and um, the angular drag coefficient. So it kind of gives you constraints. So zero is the minimum, but infinity is the max. Uh, if you don't know what any of those mean, I suggest just going to Wikipedia and reading a little bit about physics. Um, it'll help your understanding of this quite a lot. Um, but yeah, the other, the other physical materials that you have are ice. So ice has almost no drag. Um, so it'll slide around, but it's it's also, it doesn't have any bounce to it. So it'll, it'll just kind of clop down. Um, Metal is similar in that aspect. Um, yeah, it acts like metal. These are all pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Rubber is bouncy, but not quite as bouncy, <laughs> if that makes sense, because um, actual rubber, like hard rubber, isn't that bouncy. And um, wood is like a soft metal, kind of. So they all kind of change how the object interacts with the world a little bit. Um, but that's the physics system in a nutshell, kind of. So if we add a different collider to this, like a, um, say we add a sphere collider to this instead of a box collider. And, oh, we remove the box collider too. Uh, we want to make sure that that sphere collider is the size of the box. And what will happen here is a little strange. It will hit and uh, not roll, which is not exactly how something like that would work, but it is if you think about unity as being in a vacuum. If you know anything about physics, 
things in a vacuum have no force applied to them other than gravity. So this has gravity because they use gravity checkboxes there, but nothing else. If we were to add a different type of, of thing to it, like the physical materials, making it bouncy, would make it bounce up. Doop, doop, doop. Um, that's fantastic and that behaves like we would expect it to, but we still don't have any like slope or anything. If we want it to maybe collide off of something and go bouncing off into to nowhereness, maybe we should create another uh, another cube. So we have a cube. We scale that up and we drag it down and we rotate it a little bit. Now it'll hit this cube and it will behave accordingly. So it'll hit the cube, it'll bounce off that way, and then it'll start to roll. So in this way, um, we've we can create a, kind of like a, a pachinko machine, kind of, except pachinko machines are two-dimensional, right? If you've ever seen a pachinko machine, if you haven't, go look it up. <laughs> They're um, kind of sort of uh, like Chinese um, and Japanese pinball machines kind of they use them in casinos a lot they're like they're like if you combined a slot machine with a pinball machine that's kind of what they are um but we can create something like that using this method you'll also see that the um the collider the the physics simulation doesn't care about the mesh that's on the object it only cares about the collider so this sphere is now embedded in the plane because the collider is um it's obeying the collider uh, you'll also see a couple other things in the rigid body system over here, like is kinematic. Uh, essentially what that means, if you notice now it's playing and it's not falling, what that means is that other objects have to interact with it to make it move. Or rather, um, what does it say? Because uh, essentially what it means is that it doesn't move unless it's told to move, uh, essentially. So you can through code you can tell an object to be kinematic or not so sometimes that, that would be useful is um, if you want uh, an object to disappear you can turn off the renderer and disable uh, and tell it to not be to, to be kinematic that way it, it doesn't interact with the player anymore Does that makes sense um, the other things we have here uh, if we were making a pachinko machine uh, we would want to definitely freeze the, the position on the z-axis because the z-axis is the, the depth here. And we don't want it to go back or forward. We just want it to go up or down. So now that we have this thing, if we rotate this this way, you would assume that the object would then come towards us. But it won't. It'll stay... Oh, right. We have kinematic checked. Haha. <laughs> It'll, it'll stay within its own plane. It'll only ever move along this axis here, the, the, the XY plane. It won't go forward in the Z. But if we uncheck that, if we uncheck the, the freeze position, then it will come towards us uh, down here. So that's kind of what those do. The, the freeze rotation and stuff, that's all the same thing, but with the rotation axis. So if you had something like a... Um, Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure if you had an object on the ground like a log and you wanted it to only ever roll in a single direction, then you could make it roll only in the single direction. So if you only wanted it to roll along the x-axis, you could freeze it along the z and the y, and it would only ever roll um, this direction, if that makes sense. Uh, but that's kind of an example of what rigid bodies are. Um, some of the other things that you can do with these component physics um, the interactive cloth thing and the rigid body system work really well together oh oops interactive cloth where is it cloth so we create this and we scale it down and this thing is going to have a bouncy rigid body. So we're going to go component physics rigid body, and we're going to put bouncy in this. So we run this. You'll see that it bounces, and it bounces with the cloth. And that's really cool. And this thing will bounce forever because we don't have any drag on the object. 
we have angular drag but we don't have any actual drag um so the thing will literally bounce forever if we increase the drag like to 0.5 you'll see that it slowly starts to lose its its bounce and and goes down um so these two things work really really well together and the interactive cloth actually does run on the physics or the, the physics um system so that's the thing and if we don't want the uh the interactive cloth to use gravity at all we don't have to we can tell this thing to go up and we can tell it to play and it'll interact with it but it won't interact with um gravity at all so whatever it, it's like it's in zero g so if you wanted to make a game that was like set in space for example you totally can it's that easy you just tell things to not obey gravity anymore and then suddenly you have a space game <laughs> it's it's pretty straightforward um, the random acceleration on this is pretty cool. It's kind of like a wind simulation for the, the cloth sim. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, probably all fantastic and for later video. I just wanted to show that it actually does work with the rigid body system because that's what I'm talking about. Um, rigid bodies is it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the interpolation thing is is about as convoluted as it gets, I think. Uh, it like there's interpolate and extrapolate and then there's I keep clicking off of it and then there's the collision detection which is continuous and continuous dynamic um, most of the time I don't change it off of these settings and I do a lot of the stuff that the collision detection and the interpolation says it does manually through code there's a couple reasons to do it that way and I will be going over how to do that in this video or not in this video, but in this video series, uh, when I get to the C sharp stuff and after I cover the basics of that, um, interpolate in, uh, interpolation is um, so in a uh, in a game engine or in any kind of three D animation software. Uh, if you're if you're familiar with three D animation, you understand this fully well. And if you've ever done any kind of like animation, even like the the flipbook animations, you'll know what I mean things in games don't actually move so when we do this this ob Ooh, excuse me this object doesn't actually moving it's just every frame it's in a different place and we are perceiving the illusion of movement so if this object is moving really really quickly one frame it'll be here and the next frame it'll be here but if there was a wall in between like a cube like this so if we have our sphere and it's moving really, really quickly along the X, one frame it could be here and the next frame it'll be here. Both of those frames, it never detected collision. So it has no reason to stop. It just keeps going. Well, if we interpolate that, it will check the, the distance between the two to a certain extent. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't do it very well but that's i don't know that's um my opinion that's why i usually do things manually but that's essentially what that means um the collision detection continuous and continuous dynamic means is it always um is it always checking for collision all the time and uh i still don't really i'm not 100 percent familiar with the different levels of of detection like there's discrete there's continuous and there's continuous dynamic but I've never had to use anything other than discrete. Um, playing with these settings has never yielded any other strange results. But I'm sure and if I ever come across something like that in a later video, I will definitely cover that. It's always kind of um, never really confused me, but I, I've just never looked into it because it's, it's never come up. Um, so for your purposes, it probably won't ever come up. <laughs> uh, but that's basically everything on the rigid body system. So the mass is the mass. The drag is the um, like the air drag, I guess, and uh, because everything is in a vacuum unless otherwise stated in Unity. The angular drag is the drag along an object. So actually, hey, we have this handy wall. Let's angle this wall and uh, make that ball metal. So we have this, and we have this, and we're going to bring this up here, and we're going to drop this along this wall. Oh, that's all messed up. So 
So we have uh, this ramp, and we have this ball, and we're going to drop this ball down this ramp. And this ball is going to be a metal ball. So pretend that that's all the thing. Now the way that this will act currently is like so. It will roll down the ramp and stop. Well, not stop, it'll stop eventually. If we bring the angular drag of this up ridiculously high, it will fall and it will not roll as much. It'll slide more than it'll roll. If we bring the drag all up really high, it will hit, oh, it won't fall at all if it's up that high, I guess. <laughs> Funny. Well, if we lower that a bit, hopefully it'll fall. All right, so it's falling very slowly. It's like it's falling through pudding. Look at that. It's fantastic. Um, you get the idea. The angular drag is air drag. The angular, or the drag is air drag. The angular drag is rolling drag, which makes sense, right? Like the, the amount of, uh, think about it like a bowling ball. A bowling ball on a, um, on a varnished surface like the uh, floors in the bowling alley, do they slide or do they roll? They kind of do a combination of both. So if this was going to be a bowling ball, it'd probably be fairly massive, and it would probably have, um, well, not a lot of drag there, but it'd probably have a fair amount of angular drag, and it would go down like so. It'd probably be moving a lot faster, but it doesn't roll as much as it slides, is my point. That's what angular drag does. So yeah, that's uh, that is the rigid body system uh, in a nutshell. Um, I think that just about covers it for this video. In the next video, I will be talking about um, code. We will be jumping headfirst into to uh, to code objects. So be ready for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for watching, and, uh, bye-bye!